Welcome to Franchise Killer, a podcast where we pick movie franchises or wannabe franchises, review them film by film, and see where things went wrong or right. I like New York in June. How about you, Reese? It's tight. I right. like a Gershwin tune. How about you, yeah. Noah? Irene is on it. Good. Yeah, all right. Mm-hmm. All right. They, they tap it off. I like a fireside when a storm is due. How about you? I'll be amazed if anyone makes it 30 seconds into this episode. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you very much. So now that you did that, uplifted. what is your call to action? <laughs> well, you're going to have to figure that out when I we know. get there. Uh, I'm Reese. Across from me, we have David. To his left, <laughs> Irina. To my right, Barry. Oh. Barry. Oh, hey, I'm hey, Barry, Barry. Man. <laughs> also known as <laughs> Noah. <laughs> and going to the liquor store to findeth the Jack of Daniels, so he mayeth be shit faced. We have hey, AJ. <laughs> that was a good line. Did you intentionally sound inebriated there? <laughs> AJ. AJ. <laughs> intentionally? <laughs> <laughs> Just happened to work out that way. I was really hoping you were going to say, uh, and meanwhile, in the uh, parks of New York, stripping naked to look and stare at the clouds we have. Thought about it, but I wanted to go in a little bit of a different direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, spare wanted- him the embarrassment. No, I'm, I'm banned from Central Park. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> what happened days, last man? time? And the movie we're talking about is The Fisher King. Came out in 1991. It's directed by Terry Gilliam. We know him as a member of Monty Python. Also co-directed Monty Python and the Holy Grail. uh, Directed the Jabberwocky, or it's just called Jabberwocky. Mm -hmm. Time Bandits, Brazil, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, Twelve Monkeys, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, The Brothers Grimm, Tideland, and the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus. Mm-hmm. Can I just th- say, I don't think people talk about Terry Gilliam enough. Like, I know. <laughs> it, he's the master of making movies that were not hits that soon became, like, cult favorites. Yeah. Like, I think he directed his, 12 his, Monkeys? Yeah. Yeah, I was, oh. I forgot that, too. But when you think about it, it is very, like, it makes sense that he directed that. And I, Time I mean, Bandits. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you've seen Brazil, you'll understand why... 12 Monkeys is a uh, Terry Gilliam movie. And uh, this, is a, this is a director you don't normally associate with franchises. And uh, this being Franchise Killer, we were like, hey, cool. Uh, <laughs> let's, hey, cool. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about The Fisher King, the, the, uh, we, the, the, the franchise starter. I bet you always thought there was going to be a sequel to this. Yeah, uh, it turns out... There is not a sequel, and there never was planned to be a sequel, so... <laughs> Sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, big oversight on our part. We, we had all watched the movie, and uh, for some reason got mixed up on, you know, that aspect of it. Uh, we were kind of a, just going through all the various Robin Williams movies that we could cover, and slipped through our fingers that this one actually did not have a, a sequel ever intended... Uh, yes, there's certain things pulled from Arthurian legend, and there's many stories in Arthurian legend to be told, but that it was never the intention of this movie mm. whatsoever. Uh, so this one, we're just gonna, we're just gonna talk about a movie. So we're I mean, lopping. there's definitely potential. I mean, you have the double crosses and the diamond heist and everything like that, so. Diamond yeah, there's, heist. Wait, 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 wait. Heist? What has a diamond heist? Yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis... John Cleese. Oh, God. Um, Kevin Klein. Lies? What? A fish called Wanda. Oh. Uh, so you got two connections there. The John Cleese member Monty Python and uh, fish is in the title. So, yeah, sure. I'll give it to you. Fish. Uh, <laughs> I was really expecting Mo- Monty Python and the Holy Grail from you this week. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, n- no. D- we're, we're chopping the tail off of this episode. There's not going to be any <laughs> franchise talk. Uh, we're just we're just going to watch. We're, we're just going to talk about this movie and uh, break it down like we normally do. So uh, apologies. This is not the the killer of this franchise is Terry Gilliam, who never wanted one in the first place, and no one asked for one. Hey, so <laughs> maybe if they made enough money. money, the movie stars Robin Williams, Jeff Bridges, Amanda Plummer, Mercedes Rule. Michael Jeter and David Hyde Pierce, and it's written by Richard 
La Gravine- Gravinez. Nailed it. <laughs> Richard La Gravinez. I'll look it up after the fact. It's Le Gravinez. Richard La Gravinez. <laughs> and for those new to this show, on this podcast, we first go over our thoughts on the film before revisiting it for the episode. Then we dive into the story, break it down bit by bit, and talk about the more significant moments. Then towards the end of the show, we give our brief reviews and numbered scores, along with an analysis on the health of the franchise. <laughs> <laughs> and whether or not this film hurt it, which I guess yes yeah. and no. We'll just talk about how well it did. Yeah, just <laughs> think of this as we're talking about a movie. We're I'm hanging guessing. out. An ode to Robin Williams. What I will say is there's been a couple that have had the most thinnest of threads connecting yeah. them to some sort of franchise in the past. Uh, this one just happens to have no thread whatsoever. So <laughs> think no, of this as You can blame me for that. True. I kind of... Uh, mistook a satire article for the truth. Oh, yeah, I, I saw that, too. I was like, oh, here it is, and then, nope. All right, with that said, David, give us that call to action. Welcome to WKXAN, the franchise killer. We are here to bring you all your favorite franchises and all of their legacies coming to a crashing halt, and we will make fun of you while we talk about it. Is this even English? words coming out of my <laughs> mouth tonight at eight o'clock <laughs> we are here to talk to you guys about franchise killer we are a movie podcast and we love doing this and if you want to keep hearing us do what we love please follow us on apple Podcasts. give us that five star review let us know what you think we're on instagram we're on twitter we are also on youtube now i finally i, I want to say finally caught up i'm like five episodes off i'm pretty close yeah you're almost there yeah, yeah but we're gonna regularly have these new episodes on youtube now as well uh, but yeah any support that you guys feel like given uh we will take because we are not a big podcast so please help us all right with that said let's get to the story you're not gonna clarify my my call to action like you always do no it's uh, i'll just cut it all out oh, damn. five stars on <laughs> apple please yes please tell a friend Noah, you want to kick off that story? Sure. Okay, Jack, we're on the air in five, four, three, two, one. Hey, it's Monday morning, and I'm Jack Lucas. I've got the power! In the world of talk radio, hey! Jack Lucas was king. Look, I said I want an offer they can forget it. To stay on top, he did whatever he had to. Forgive me! But one day... Jack went too far. It was Mr. Lucas's offhand remark that seemed to have fatal impact on Mr. Malnick. No matter what I have, it feels like I have nothing. Yo, what's going on? And just when he was about to give up on his own life, he stumbled into Perry's. Unhand that degenerate and remove your presence! I like New York in June. How about you? You know who I am? A hood ornament. No. I'm a knight on a special quest. A quest? And I need help. You're out of your mind! Jack is a successful radio show host when tragedy strikes. His words drive a fan to murder multiple people. Three years later, and Jack is not doing so hot, an alcoholic with suicide on the mind. One bad night, he goes out drinking, planning to end it all, and is attacked by some chads. When Perry, a homeless man on a quest for the Holy Grail, protects him and takes him in for the night. It is soon revealed that Perry's wife was killed in the incident three years ago. Jack now feels that if he helps Perry, he will also help himself. You're, you know what? Those guys are probably the closest to chads that we've ever gotten to. Like when you say chads, no, those are chads. There are some legit ones. That's some that those guys though. Those are guys the worst. were U- yeah. Uber they're, chads. They're a little worse than chads. Yeah, those are like the eighties street gang. Like, hey man, we're tweaking right now. <laughs> like the guys from uh, what was it? Howard the Duck. Do you guys remember those those guys? I've been doing yep. too much toot. <laughs> <laughs> too much toot, man. Much. <laughs> and then we get to see some duck breasts. Yeah. All right. We're not on that movie. Yeah, I don't know why you're fixated on Look, that. Look, man, my brain is taking me some places. I feel like I'm in Robin Williams' headspace in this movie where there's like no coherent line and it jumps from like <laughs> thing to thing. I'm like, I'm going to find the Holy Grail by the there's end of this. There's a coherent line. This movie's like about a lot of things, though. Mm-hmm. Like so much to the point where like I'm I'm nervous to even speak on it. <laughs> it's too deep and, for its own good. <laughs> I know. Uh, but yeah, the movie starts off with uh, Jeff Bridges playing Jack. He's kind of a radio host who's 
modeled after Howard Stern. Actually, in, in fact, that, that was confirmed in my oh, research. Really? Like he's actually modeled after Howard Stern, and Howard Stern wanted to contribute to this, but uh, they didn't want to pay him, so he decided not to contribute. <laughs> uh, but he he is still kind of modeled after that, just like sh- a shock jock kind of saying offensive right. things, but people like him for it. Uh, when he's about to hit his big break and uh, kind of star in a TV show, and people are about to see his... Well, I mean, he's about to become a not just a radio star, but also someone on TV. A, like, a physical personality. Yeah, and yeah. he's very excited for people to see the face behind his voice. Uh, on this very night, though, before this, uh, what I would imagine was the premiere of this show, uh, one of the, the people who called in to his show uh, was vo- vocalizing his problems. and He wanted a girl. He liked a girl. Yeah, he a and, woman. And, yeah, and basically he said, "You gotta, you know, grab life by the balls." Those, that that's not exactly what he said, but he said, "It's it's us or them." No, he said that those kind of people are like idiots, and they're the scum of the earth, and we need to end them. But he said, "It's us or them." Yeah, it's, yeah. Basically, a uh, catcher in the rye phonies moment. Yeah, yeah, and this results in the guy shooting up a place, killing five people, and then killing himself. And uh, then we fast forward. Three years later, mm-hmm. and uh, he is much more down on his luck yeah. because he's become a drunk, and he works at this video store uh, and has a girlfriend there as well, who she kind of owns the video store. But uh, yeah. anyway, so- something I notice about Terry Gilliam up to this point is that he he has a lot... He, he is juggling at least a, a few different tones, and some of it's very dark, and yeah. some of it is just zany straight up comedy off the wall just right trippy weird fantastical humor uh how are y'all feeling at this point of the movie how it's juggling these tones also thoughts on jeff bridges i guess oh i love jeff bridges in this role i think he i i know david and i were watching this um interview with him and how uh, he was kind of turning down the role at first thinking that there would be other people better suited for this part specifically he was trying to name people that were better than him right right and uh terry gilliam just knew for sure no you're the one we want like please just do this just to buy yeah Yeah, so It, it speaks for him in this role that i at first didn't recognize him as jeff bridges and then I started hearing his voice more, yeah. and I was like, "Jeff Bridges? Yep, it's <laughs> yeah. his hair, I, man." I, I yeah. think this this movie is very well balanced as far as taking this character that, on all accounts, you should find him stereotypically despicable. Mm-hmm. Like you, you don't like this character. Usually, people don't like this character, but I think Jeff Bridges manages to. Um, display both that side of like trying to attain notoriety Mm -hmm. but that being relatable to most people and also the fact that he's sort of hiding something that's really really sensitive and close to his heart like kind of building walls Mm -hmm. so he i i agree with terry gilliam here he's like the perfect choice for Mm -hmm. this role i i i will say it was almost a little bit jarring how quickly he he uh, like they didn't set him up as someone who would feel any remorse about anything. Mm. So when the that shooting happens and he has that sudden change in character, right? It like I he 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 takes me as the person who would feel like he he would feel like this was bad because it would hurt his image. Mm. But in that moment, it almost seemed like he felt bad about that situation, uh, which to me wasn't consistent. But it does become consistent further on. They in just the didn't story. give the details till later. I yeah. I would. I think that's actually intentional. The point of it was to note that he just didn't really have any real ramifications for his right. actions until that moment, and, and that then he was saw a big very, action. He yeah. saw a very real repercussion to so, something he directly saw. Right. Maybe it's a think, mix of both. Too. I think this is a very good representation of. The per- a person that's rough around the edges. Like, you kind of get your Hollywood version of this where they're still really likable because, mm-hmm. oh, they're cool, you know, they're mm-hmm. brooding, they're moody. But this is a true kind of, like, 
embarrassing example of what it's like to be someone that's become kind of nihilistic, you mm-hmm. know, and just against the world. They're kind of an a-hole. Like when you are mm-hmm. a person like that, you're a bit of an a-hole, but it's yeah. it's coming from a place of great sensitivity. So yeah. I, mm-hmm. I well. really like it's it's a quick transition, but I still like this transition. Yeah. And it's it's this whole movie is layered with symbolism. Um, oh my gosh, I mean, this is like this the is title. like the AJ movie. Yeah, but I mean, he starts out. I mean, with these shots back and forth, kind of oscillating him around him, you know, in this literal cube, his his studio, um, right? As he's you know on the radio, but yeah, he's he's walled off. It's all dark. He's wearing sunglasses. Like it's literally isolation. Uh-huh. And so it's kind of, you know, analogous to modern day keyboard warrior where they're behind the keyboard. They say whatever they want because there's no outside connection, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're insulated. Um, but then, you know, this this thing happens in the real world and it kind of brings it home. And yes, it hits him home as in, wow, that's actually traumatic because it's such a big deal. But, you know, also the selfishness about it. How does this affect me? I mean, we go through this scene of him literally practicing this one throwaway line you know over and over and over to death mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. you know and, and the colors everything's all black in his apartment everything's black in the studio and then we you know go to where he is now he's still wearing kind of this black overcoat but everything else is kind of washed and everything's kind of got light pouring in from the, the cracks and stuff and it's it's literally video killed the radio star um, right you know mm-hmm. he goes from being radio to working at you know a video rental store so yeah. um, you've got that reversal there, and then it, and then ob- the obvious sort of song that pairs with him while he's working, which is "I Got the Power." I think it's by Snap. Um, it's like "I Got the Power." It's like yeah. wow, that they kind of leaned into that one. It's a little <laughs> on the nose. When I uh, hear that song, I always think of Bruce, Bruce Almighty. Almighty. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Boom. Okay, the people can't see me doing my fingers, guns, <laughs> people. All right. Uh, <laughs> Well, and then yeah, the but, line he's saying is "forgive me," like in a sardonic way, um, right? And that kind of echoes like throughout the entire movie. Is he looking for forgiveness? Because right, it's a superficial line that he's saying as an actor, and even then, it's you know ironic, and it's always yeah. playing with how it's presented. But you know, at the, the base of it, does he actually yeah. is he asking for forgiveness throughout the entire movie? Yeah, mm-hmm. and and. Let's wrap back around to, to how this movie juggles tones before we get into Robin Williams' character. Uh, but I, or I guess this can kind of segue into Ro- Robin Williams, but how do you think this movie balances the heavy with the light? Do you think it, it these coalesce well, or is it ever jarring when one of these tones like hits the other like a freight train? Uh, I I don't think it, it bothers me at all, and I, I think it's because... I'm coming from a place where I'm very familiar with Terry Gilliam's work, especially when it comes to uh, something like Time Bandits Mm -hmm. and his involvement with Monty Python. It's just, this is sort of what I expected, rather than maybe 12 Monkeys, which is a little different. It's a little more serious. I actually, I think it's masterful, personally. Like, I I think this guy does an excellent job of... uh, Like, there's this whole romantic period of this movie in the Mm -hmm. middle, and we'll get Uh to it, where you just almost forget about all of the traumatic stuff that's happened, and and no other movie would would I just be able to purge that from my mind until it's brought back Mm -hmm. up again, Uh, but he he manages to do it. It's a weird magic trick of a movie. It's also kind of just reflective on reality. Like, that's kind of how you live life, is that there are moments where it's incredibly traumatic, but then there are others where you kind of forget about the tragedy and that mm-hmm. it's just this weird experience that you're having. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's kind of like, um, if you, let me try to visualize this a little bit, like, you know, instead of being a homo- homogenous mixture, like you put something in a blender, like make a smoothie and you put it on blend, like everything's all the same uh-huh. consistency. That's not what this movie is. Like you have the tone, tonal differences of the lighthearted and the kind of crazy, but you also right. have the, the trauma on the heart of it. Um, like, it's like, I guess, maybe a vinaigrette, like towel dressing. Like, you have oil and water that are immiscible. They don't mix together, right. blend. But you shake it up, and, you know, you've got these different parts that make a whole. Or even, like, no. um, ooh, this is a better example. Like, 
you know, you're walking through a parking lot and you have, you know, see a puddle and it's got oil floating on it. You see these rainbow kind of effects and yeah. like different layers. Like those things don't mix, but it's kind of still got this pretty effect of it with the rainbows and the colors and the bands and the right. streaking. And it's this u- d- ugly, dirty thing, but there's this kind of beauty in it. Uh, yes. Yeah. Because those things don't blend, like it's still got the depth of it. Um, right. Yeah. In fact, um, I had a note where I, I, I said, this is the most beautiful, ugly movie I've yeah. seen. I, uh, yeah. it, it is, it's also like pineapples on pizza. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there's a, there are a few movies that capture the mood of this movie. Like, I, I, I'm, I was trying to wrap my brain around other ones that have this sort of energy. I have one. But Na- no, Na- I, have, I have one, but I want to hear what you no, say No, no, no. You go first. Uh, Cat the Woman. other one that comes to me is The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Oh, where okay, it's yeah. It's very dark, but has sort of... It, you have a comedic lead, and it still is beautiful in its own way. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think this, Blade Runner. Interesting. This, okay. This one might seem a little weird to you, but um, The Mask... In some yeah. ways, reminds yeah, me of this bit. brand of crazy. And maybe that's just the whole <laughs> '90s of it. Who knows? I, I think that might be it. Yeah. But uh, I, I think going along with uh, your question, what helps carry this is a lot of the camera angles too, where this can the camera angles that are used. Like you, you told me that there's a a Dutch angle. Yeah, that's like what you Dutch angles yeah. hard. Yeah, for sure. So. Um, I think that too, it's it's supposed to be kind of like just a visual cue to the audience that, hey, you kind of have to view this. Squint your eyes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you have to view this in a way where this isn't completely normal, but it's still tackling very mm-hmm. real situations. Yep. Another thing I wanted to commend this movie about is... Um, Tackling the, it, not necessarily tackling the issue of homelessness, but kind of showing you a new look or view of being homeless, Humanizing especially in them, New York, I would say. Yeah. where it's, it's very easy to, like, there are so many movies that just kind of use homeless people as a joke. You yeah. know, or just like, oh yeah, it's this running Scenery. gag where where this one homeless man comes in and says something goofy and everyone kind of laughs and moves on with their mm-hmm. lives. So it's it's very grounding. Yeah, you don't in normally that way. see them as a community, right? With their own kind of you know their viewpoints and yeah. history and background and uh, why they are there in the first place. And you get more than just Robin Williams' character Perry. Yeah, and and we should get into Perry since a we're whole a whole up real lot quick. more. Um, anyone that's listening that still getting into movies and terminology and stuff, a Dutch angle is kind of a tilted diagonal oblique angle. Um, right. If, yeah. if you've seen... If unfamiliar with the photography, cinematography terms. If you've right. seen with the first Thor, that movie is looks like it's seesawing because of how many times it Dutch angles back and forth. I feel like it's usually there to create yeah. an unease inside of yourself. Yeah, it, that movie abuses that. <laughs> <laughs> like This one uses it correctly because it is meant... As it, it is a intentional artistic choice with a purpose, whereas in Thor, it's just like, hey, it looks cooler when it's turned sideways. <laughs> like that's it's like a gun. You just, yeah. like, it always looks cooler when you have yeah. it sideways. Um, but yeah, uh, Robin Williams. Oh yeah, Robin. This is a Robin Williams miniseries, so we got we got to talk Perry, uh, Perry. otherwise uh, known as Percival. Or I think it's Henry. I think well. I wonder if he, I actually don't think he is Percival in no, the No, that's what he's based off of. Is he really? Like, yeah. I thought for some reason that Jack was supposed to be Percival seeking it out it's, and, uh, uh, and Perry was Parsifal. the Fisher King. Parsifal. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Perry, uh, ro- uh, played by Robin Williams, he's a he's the homeless man that helps out uh, uh, Jeff Bridges or Jack in his time of need. Uh, honestly, d- need is a weird word because he was trying to commit suicide in this act, but uh, there, the Chads know it was referencing. I can dumped. imagine people don't usually want to be burnt alive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, drowning <laughs> yourself. He's, is he's being doused in gasoline, and uh, in comes Perry to the rescue with all sorts of. He is adorned in all sorts of trash to look like a bit of a, a, a trash knight. Uh-huh. Uh, and he's got a, a number of people behind him coming to the rescue. Uh, they scare the bullies away. They, they kind of put the hurt on one of them. And uh, 
uh, Jack is taken back to his little his little uh, hideout, I guess, where he's got all sorts of weird trinkets, and he's talking to little fat flying fairies, fairies that no one else <laughs> mm-hmm. can see. And uh, it's yeah, that's our first intro to to Robin Williams. Uh, how does this stack up against what we've talked about so far, or or Robin Williams uh, his what he's all his work? Like so I think this this ranks pretty high up there. Oh yeah, it's a mm. unique take for him but it, he's perfect in almost every movie i've seen him in but this is just like a yep this fits his talents well, this fits not, exactly in his sphere of talents and it's not quite a comedy no but he <laughs> provides comedic relief so yeah one of the interesting things i found about watching this movie is usually robin williams steals the scene for me mm-hmm. in this i think he was very tastefully used to he didn't distract from all the messages or, you know, the intention of the movie. He was just the right amount of zany. And I never, I always forgot that, oh yeah, this is Robin Williams, you know, like this is, is, he's a comedian. (laughs) It's like the nacho cheese to your pickle, you know? It is almost the, the most, the the best. (laughs) Yeah, I was wondering about that one too. That deserves a pause. Sorry, what were you saying? (laughs) It is... (laughs) It is almost the best distillation of who Robin Williams is, mm-hmm. both as an actor and as a person, in a weird way. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. it's like, he it's humorous. It's a humorous performance. Tender, at times, which he does really well. Um, manic. Right. And it even deals with the, and this was not anticipated, but it, it's mental illness as well. Yeah. Which right. Which is something that he he ended up suffering from later in his life. Uh, so it's it's just kind of almost full circle. Sadly serendipitous. Yeah, is that a, yeah. a word that I could use for Are, this? Appropriate. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's um, it feels genuine. Yeah, it yeah. does. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's just I was like, wow, this is this is about as Robin Williams as you get. Yeah. In hi- it's a but in hindsight, right? You know, not re- maybe not in the moment. Who who knows? So maybe well, also just to elucidate for the the listener here. Because I think we've talked about it a little bit is Robin Williams is playing a homeless character who previously used to be a professor or a teacher mm-hmm. um, whose wife was murdered in the cafe by our main protagonist. Protagonist? No, it wasn't him. But it, it... <laughs> no, no, no. It was from the result of his words. Words, yeah. yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, technically he feels like he's connected to Perry through the death of his wife. Well, that that's his whole depression is that. Not only does he just feel connected, he feels like he's directly responsible. Yeah. And as he probably should. Um, what were you saying, AJ? Yeah, and I, I don't know if we're talking about Goodwill Hunting or not, but um, I mean, watch that movie immediately after this movie and like see Robin's perf- or Robin Williams' performances, um, especially with that depth of the trauma and stuff. And it's like, I don't know, it's pretty powerful stuff. Now, right. we forgot to talk about our background with this movie. Who had seen this movie before? Who hadn't? Oh, that's right. Well, we did not talk about that. You're right. I had not. Yeah. Well, Maurice, not. do you want to cue it up? The yeah, No, you... I'm not even going to edit it in. Don't... Yeah. No, I was we just curious because anyway. if, you know, seeing uh, Robin Williams in this performance, how um, easy was it to accept? I think we're talking about that now. So that's why I brought it up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I had def- And sorry for not bringing it up earlier. I have definitely not seen this movie before. I had heard of it. But n- not even close to having seen it. I hadn't even point. heard of this movie, which blows my mind considering this falls directly into my wheelhouse of movies. Yeah. Yeah. Never I think you and I are the same, David. I hadn't heard of it and I haven't seen it. So, um, and I, I'm kind of sad I hadn't because <laughs> yeah, no. uh, I really enjoyed it. Mm. Never heard of it. AJ, had you seen it? I had. Um, I don't remember how exactly it might have been even randomly on TV, but it's not something that plays on TV too often. But yeah, it's uh, definitely kind of a, I guess, hidden gem, so to speak. And yeah. Really, mm-hmm. Like we're talking about is a great performance by Robin Williams that highlights some of his best talent. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I um, honestly, we'll, we'll talk about more of the characters soon, but. There is an amazing cast of characters in this movie. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm yeah. surprised I hadn't heard of this before. Uh, so uh, Jack kind of slinks his way out of there. Uh, Jack is, and uh, Perry's trying his best to get him to help with this quest to go find the the Holy Grail. He's 
he's clearly a little delusional and uh Jack is grateful that he he helped him but he's also like get me the get me the hell out of here. <laughs> so I guess it's fair to say like we're right now at the point where he wakes up the next morning after being saved by Perry in this like weird slum of a place seeing mm-hmm. you know pictures of there's, devils on the wall. There's like a weird shrine shrine of some yeah. lady. Yeah. So uh, but I could understand why Jack is kind of like, get me the hell out oh, of no, here. No, I'd be, I'd be the same way. In fact, um, he, he deals with it pretty, well, somewhat graciously. A hangover will consider, do that. Considering the circumstances. I mean, I'd, I'd be the same. I, I would feel a comfort in this man just because I was going to die and now I'm not dead yeah. because of this person. Yeah. So in that sense, I would. But I also would, he's weird and psychotic and yeah. I kind of want to get out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he, he feels some guilt towards this man. And he, especially since he learned that he is uh, responsible after this very exposition-y uh, line from the the person that owns this, this uh, I want to say hotel. Is boiler like hotel. room area. Uh, yeah. He, yeah, he lets him in the boiler room. I don't, or boiler room, I don't know. I don't know what kind hotel. of establishment it is, but he, uh, he basically says, like, oh, yeah, I've let him stay here because of the murders, remember? The tragedy. Yeah. Um, His wife was murdered. Yeah, so he, he goes back to find him. Gives him gives him money, and he is not really uh, he he's receptive to his kindness, but he ultimately just gives the money right to another guy. I and love it, that. It kind of yeah. just frustrates <laughs> frustrates. What the Jack. hell, man? Yeah. So that his this kind of keeps their connection going, and ultimately he does end up deciding to you know spend a little more time with uh, Perry and maybe help get him on his feet. It, yeah. it, but at this point, he's only really doing it because he wants to have a clear conscience, not because yeah. he wants to make some sort of meaningful connection. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he wants to buy off his guilt. Yeah, right. exactly. Like, l- literally buy off his guilt. <laughs> what are those things called in medieval times that where you could pay the, the church for your sins and it would just wash penance. them away? Yeah, penance. Mm-hmm. Like you just pay pay your way. Yeah. It's like DLC. <laughs> uh, how, how are you feeling at this point without moving further into the story? Like... Oh yeah, I'm I'm definitely invested. I just I'm with it. It's it's one of those where like while you're watching it, um, it's not where you expected not the film to go at all. Mm. It, it's definitely one of those movies where like I think you mentioned this Reese before, where you you look at the cover, you read the title, and you kind of expect it to go one way, but it's. It's totally, totally different. <laughs> I was expecting a straight up drama with nothing fantastical whatsoever. Uh, then when I saw Terry Gilliam, I was like, yeah. oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically, there isn't really anything hugely fantastical. There's not, not the way. Stuff. There's nothing no, no, no. literally not, fantastical. Not the way you would expect not like Terry Hook. Gilliam to go. Like, Hook fantasy kind of is different than this, for sure. True. It's, it's kind of, I, I just love, I think the two of these characters already had great chemistry together. Yeah. As far as the kind of mm-hmm. the cynical, sort of callous, but still kind hearted, sort of resisting um, character. And then the one that, even though he's from uh, Jack's point of view, probably at the lowest of the low, he's still looking at life mm-hmm. through kind of kids' mm-hmm. lenses. So it's, um, I, I, am thoroughly invested at yeah. this point. It, it kind of gives me, uh, you know, Rayman vibes with the the duo mm. that they've. I could see that. Got going. I see that sort of like this uh, <laughs> resistance to uh, liking them, but yes. then finding they can't help themselves, but make sure they're okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. It's, it's, it's weirdly opposites attract, and one of them doesn't realize it yet. Yeah, but mm. he is in a, a weird way drawn to this person, despite you know, how yeah, he is right now. Exactly. Uh, Quick correction, on, it's not penance, it's indulgence. Indulgence, um, someone that's jumps the on one. one. Yeah. What a word to use for that. Indulgence. <laughs> uh, before we move on, let's let's talk about Oscar winner Mercedes Rule as Anne, Jack's girlfriend. Wait, I, she won an Oscar? Yeah, she won an Oscar for this, this performance. Like, this movie was nominated for Why are you surprised? Oscars. I was she, gonna say she, she did was great. no 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 Wonderful. no I okay don't jump on me I, I agree I think she was great I just I wouldn't have suspected I thought this was like a sleeper movie where like it got maybe nominated bigger... for five Oscars okay uh, well maybe uh, I somehow missed this I don't pfft. yeah uh, dude no, she is fantastic yeah she did a great job yeah both her and Robin Williams were nominated for Oscars Robin didn't win but she did 
but she has not really she's kind of like faded from the public eye since then like mm-hmm. she's not a, a a huge name per se i didn't know about um, her but yeah dude i i think she does an excellent job uh she does it, it's almost like you almost want to say cliche New Yorker, but she does it just so well. Uh, yeah, the reason mm-hmm. she's not cliche is because she's actually down to earth. Like she does the yeah. New York thing, and then she's but she shows a softer yeah, side. Yeah, she's almost mm-hmm. like the yeah. per- the perfect interpretation. Meanwhile, of that. every other show or movie is like, I walk in here. Like hey. you want you want to see the the terrible version of this? Watch Godzilla, the nineteen ninety six, ninety seven, ninety eight, Reese, ninety eight. That's right, ninety eight. Uh, yeah, there's a. There's some there's some bad New Yorkers in that movie. <laughs> what are uh, you doing over here, Tony? Look, I told you not to be walking down the street over here. You'll get the gun to the face, man. What? That's, I don't. Uh, I'm, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I can't do accents. <laughs> I can't. I can't do. You it. have to do two accents but at once. I That's can never do it. one. <laughs> it's either going to be like Indian right. going into Australian or Irish into Australian or American into New York, Australian. Just dis- New York's a very diverse and, place. It's okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank David you. decides not just to offend one type of person, but to just I'm gonna roll mix them all, them in, all there. in there. Just, just for our listeners' sake, you should all know that no one ever expects me in this podcast to do these things, and every time I do them, people are looking at me like, "No, <laughs> why, like, why are you doing, doing this?" And I just go for it. So uh, if you like it, let me know. I uh, think that I. It, it's so weird as I'm uh, thinking about this movie. How? They were able to make all of these characters Mm three-dimensional in a very unique, believable way. Even though this film is kind of set in a fanciful style. Mm -hmm. So her her character makes a lot of sense along with Jack's character. And uh, just sort of there's there's immediate chemistry between them two. Like I can totally see them as a real relationship. Yeah. It's just um I really love their yeah. dynamic a lot. And and you end up loving her because she's just kind of the the perfect person. She to is help the him. ultimate girlfriend and exactly. he should be much more grateful. Oh yeah. <laughs> but I think she she sees like basically what's going on deep down and she's patient. So yeah. I I think that's almost like what he needed. Mm-hmm. It, he needed someone that's very direct, very blunt. And loyal. And also somebody who respects weird. Yeah. yeah. And not not a lot of people do. And it the first thing that came to mind for me was Anchorman 2. I think Kristen Wiig's character with Steve Carell. Mm-hmm. Like, these two weirdos that just somehow mesh Are really Are you talking well. about Perry and uh, the other woman? I'm mixing up I'm, Jack and... I don't yeah. think <laughs> Sorry. Well, no, we're, we're talking about uh, Jack, Jack and, and... What's her name? Why am I blinking? Anne. Yeah. And yes, I was I was thinking of her act her ac- the actual actress's name. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's interesting because everybody kind of has a grail that they're searching uh-huh. for in this movie, and um, you know we can talk. About, I don't know if Irina wants to briefly say what the Fisher King story is from Arthurian legend. Oh. Later on, but, um, but I think you know, a few I think of us even know. what uh, Perry says. You know the line where the fool comes in and and finds the grail because he was giving the king water yep. and he just said you know how did he find it he said i don't know i just knew that you were thirsty so i got yeah. you this cup of water well she just knows that jack is thirsty so she does anything she can to help right so she's got that kind of quest she's on every, um, every even you know i guess as a side character so to speak she has her own quest that she's on um, right which is really cool because everybody's not just kind of sidelined beyond the main protagonist right they're not all just lampshades walking around. Like, Jack's not the only main character, which is great. And it's uh, the fact that you bring that up is interesting because she herself is a grail. And mm-hmm. it's uh, and Jack, you know, he's constantly searching for, you know, I need to uh, somehow redeem myself. I need to get over this guilt. I need to be uh, well known. I need to make it in this world and be happy. But she's right there which in the story like the grail it it seems is like kind of right there but he didn't see it and she's right there kind of like uh perry realizes later on we'll get there but he says like man a good woman like you going to waste here like kind of a thing (laughs) she's she's literally right there she's 
Jack's grail, essentially. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and at the same time, if you go from the depiction that a lot of us know from Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade, like, you know, right. it's not all the fancy, really shiny ones with all the jewels. And, right. And not, it's like the clay, you know, humble one. So, yes. Yeah. All right. Noah, do you want to continue that story there? After finding out Perry has a dream girl, Jack goes about setting them up on a date. It works, and they find that they love each other. Jack is finally feeling free again, even going back to his agent to get his job back, when Perry gets attacked and goes into a catatonic state. Feeling like there is nothing else he can do, Jack goes to retrieve the Holy Grail for Perry, in order to bring him out of his catatonic state. He brings the trophy to Perry, and after a while, Perry finally wakes up. They both go back to their significant others, and then the movie closes with Jack and Perry, both naked, laying on the grass, staring at the sky in Central Park. Yes. Mm. Honestly, that is a perfect ending. That we'll is get a to it, but ending. I just want to say that now. <laughs> Love that ending. Yeah. Nailed it. Nailed it. Oh, hopefully not. Phrasing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> anyway, the character of the Red Knight uh, kind of embodying you know, really physically manifest a manifestation of Perry's trauma that kind right. of gets in the way every time he kind of almost has a breakthrough or tries to, uh, you know, remember get better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that blew I mean, it's, my it's mind. It's very visceral. Like it's, it's terrifying. You feel the tra- oh, yeah. tra- like trauma. Yeah. Not to be literal, but that blew my mind when I realized like what that night was actually representing yeah it represented visually wife's mind being blown yeah uh (laughs) that's what i'm saying Mm -hmm. (laughs) um but yeah it was a the fire represents the gunshot and the 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 spindly red things coming like the Mm -hmm. the fact that it's red and the fact that it's got all these tendrils and tendrils spines Mm -hmm. going out that represents the the I don't Blast, know, the, the I violence. Guess, yeah. I, I was violence gonna say stuff. like the, the guts and stuff being strewn about. Yeah, I know. I we, think Irina described uh the, the red knight as a what, what was it, Irina? Was it I a I was lion? just thinking of a lionfish, lion like fish. one of those with Yeah, it did all the it little... had that look for sure. Ah, uh, it's so cool. Uh yeah, this is a another thing that this movie I, I feel like does a really good job of doing, or or at least what I think it's it's about is these two characters having very different forms of trauma and the them being brought together they are able to pull each other up in different right. ways um and i think that no other people would be perfectly matched to pull the other person out of like the dark pit that they're in yeah uh but i feel like that that solidifies in the second half um well you finally start seeing the actual internal good person from Jack come out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's no longer well, trying to buy his way through. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like both of these people are not the people that they used to be in a very distinct way. Um, yeah. And then the kind of development is do they go back to who they were? Or do they move on to be a new person? Yeah. And did you want to, since we're talking about some, some of the, the symbolism of the red Knight and, uh, some of this movie's more direct connections to Arthurian legend. Did y- did y'all want to like enlighten me to some of these connections? Because I I know only the faintest of, you know, I, I recognize only the faintest of mm-hmm. bits of story and symbolism here. The story of Parsifal. The story of Parsifal. So. Uh, from what I understand, Parsifal was um, raised by a mom who tried to get him away from the world. They lived in the woods, um, and, and sure enough, he did not even come into contact with people until later in life where these knights came through the woods, and he's like, hey, I want to be, be a knight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I want to do that. Um, so he leaves. His mother dies of a broken heart. He doesn't even turn around because mm. he's just so gung-ho on being a knight. He goes to um, his local court his local kingdom wherever you want to call it um and i guess they have like a whole prodigy kind of thing where they're like oh if this person can make the queen laugh or whoever laugh i'm sorry any i look the point is there's some sort of legend prophecy prophecy, that's the word (laughs) uh that if this knight can make progeny i hate you (laughs) I don't even know if it's the queen. This is a butchered version. It, don't hate me. Don't write me negative fan mail. Purgatory. Wait, I thought he was a baker, not a butcher. 
So he comes in there and he ends up making um, this lady laugh, and that's supposed to be the prophecy. Like, oh, he's the one who's supposed to see, supposed to seek the Grail, and so they send him out to seek the Grail, which is Percival. And he's going out, and he ends up running into the Fisher. No, no, he runs. Was it the Fisher King at the time? Irina, help me. Hey, yeah, I think... tag out. Wait, what? <laughs> uh, isn't that tap in? Ta- <laughs> tag out and Baton tap in are the same pass. thing. It's wrestling. Irene, do you remember he originally goes to a kingdom and they let him in and he actually like sees the grail? Yeah. So, yeah, he goes to this castle essentially and there's a king there. And the king seems like despondent or sad, but because it's a part of the chivalric code for knights to not say a word because it might be, you know, kind of stupid. stupid. Mm -hmm. Uh, So they just, he didn't say anything about it and he feasted there from the grail and then eventually fell asleep he wakes up the next day and the castle is empty and so he leaves the castle he hears the drawbridge go up and he turns around and the castle is gone so uh no grail for him Mm, but um i i think essentially the story was that he finds out that he should have asked the king like you know what's what ails you basically mm-hmm. and the wound would have been healed and he would have the grail but he didn't so um i think eventually he does end up finding the castle again he finds the fisher king yeah oh, he yeah. finds the fisher king but um you want to go no ahead? no no i just want to clarify i just remember the fact that he literally was like he made it his life's mission to find the grail he kind of like even denounced christianity he's like F all this. I'm going to find the grail. I don't even care the reason. I'm going to find it. Yeah. And so he goes on the world and he doesn't find it, but he does find out that people suck and he hated that. Um, but then eventually he kind of gives up and that's when he runs into the Fisher King. And the so Fisher... is the Fisher King in this Jack? Well, that's what I was no, thinking. I think the Fisher King is... Th- Perry? What, yeah. <laughs> Which one of these guys hates people, right? Jack hates people. Mm-hmm. That's why I thought he was and Parcival. Parcival, yeah. yeah. I agree. Which That's what I was the thinking. Fisher King is... And P- the Fisher King is, uh, is Perry. Perry. That's what I was yeah. thinking. Yeah, yes. okay. Oh, you just said the other way. Well, earlier I said that. I don't know if I got confused there. But the yeah. point is, he Parsifal runs into the Fisher King, who is kind of like... He has connections to has the connections. Grail. But mm-hmm. he doesn't... Ha- it's like he's so detached from the world. I can't remember that part. Irina, help me tag out again. No, I, I'm sorry. I can't I think it, it's actually tag in. You could do both. Point is, like, after all of this struggle, he f- he ends up finding the castle again and has kind of learned to ask what ails you to this king. And the wound is healed and he gets the grail, essentially. Boom. So I I think that maybe Terry Gilliam's in, uh, purpose in this was just kind of oh, this story sort of reflects still today as far as everyone is really busy and self-focused on what their goal is and what they need to be. But even the further you seek it out, the worse you feel almost, Mm. like the less fulfilled you feel. It's never exactly what you need. It's just what you want. That is definitely one of the themes that I do think carries through throughout this whole movie yeah. and we we did talk about it earlier with every character has their grail that they they are seeking but don't know that it's right in front of them right yeah yeah also if you're confused listener if galahad is the one who normally goes after the grail it is but there's like a lot of apparently there's a lot of connections i was apparently just, i was do, i was confused because no, no, no. i thought he was <laughs> Apparently, the Grail is between... something like everybody wants. So. Like Jesus. <laughs> yeah. um, There's also technically a difference between Parzival and Percival, which are different. Yeah. But also the same, <laughs> well, depending on how they were um, mm-hmm. adopted. Yep. Anyway. Writers just couldn't get their shit together. Yeah, <laughs> these are just tales people tell. So At least it's not it gets, Oedipus it gets... where you're, you know, mm-hmm. killing right. your dad. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's move on. Yeah. I yeah, prefer so... the Green Knight. Throughout the whole portion of this movie, or, or in, at least in this beginning section, we have a whole lot of uh, Jack and Perry just playing off of each other. It's mostly Perry getting into all sorts of kind of shenanigans and, and Jack being embarrassed, but kind of going along with it. Um, this is where it turns into a romantic comedy. Yeah, ultimately... We're literally running... Uh, I mean, 
I guess that was earlier on, but like literally running after imaginary things. But yeah, now they're yeah. chasing the damsel in distress, I guess, maybe. Yeah. Right. It, it becomes a, a, a romantic comedy, and it makes something that should be so creepy very, very, very sweet. Right. Where mm. he's basically, or uh, Perry is basically stalking this yeah. yeah this woman. He's been stalking her for who knows how long, but he knows everything about her. Uh, but just She's because also you know... somewhat socially atypical, I guess you could say. Right. Yeah. And I should say this is uh, Amanda Plummer, this actress here, who plays, yeah, she, they're, they're both very much out there, I'll just say, to be kind. Um, Anyone who's watched How I Met Your Mother, this is the prime example of the Doppler versus Dahmer effect, which is like stalking and and highly coveting or like highly liking somebody enough where you watch them like it, there's a line in the sand and this one um this one treads that line more than any other thing maybe other than you yeah. the tv show i think the the thing that makes it okay is that she actually has a conversation where uh her character talks about how she believes she never makes an impression on anyone yeah. So the fact that he is just aware of her every movement is Aww, a huge compliment to her. And, and the thing is, it's also, it's a two-hander, because it's her being yeah. in the, that specific state that she's in. And it's also Robin Williams' performance, him being so totally earnest, yeah. that when he says what he's been doing, you don't view it as being a, a stalker in that sense. Right. Well, you no. view it because as someone... he's actually not being creepy. He's it, being it, honest. Well, you view it as someone who has seen something beautiful and is like, oh, I just have to, like... Have to see it again. Admire that. Or, admire yeah. it from afar. That's yeah, a and, good way to put it. Yeah, it, but since it's Robin Williams, you just... You're not creeped out by it. It's like, no, this guy... He, he's he's innocent in that sense. I, I think that's where I, they do it really well in this. Sorry, no, I didn't mean to. No, admit. you're fine. I just think because if it's any other show, they would show them like hiding behind a corner like, oh, yeah. there she is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But more, he's out in the open. He's just like, there's the beautiful girl. And he's like spinning around like a kind of, you know, yeah. confused person. Yeah. And this is, again, is what I talk about with like juggling tones. Like, mm -hmm. how is Gilliam able to do this where he can have these shockingly brutal, dark, it scenes both, you know, uh, what's the word, literal and figurative, uh, and then have this light and breezy romantic, you know. It feels like a subplot. Yeah. But it's we not. have the talent there to, to manage it. And, yeah. and you mm -hmm. contrast all this, you know, endearing, you know, kind of doting romanticism. And then yeah. uh, Perry, like, literally <laughs> tries to take off his pants in front of uh, Anne because. <laughs> yeah. It's the chivalrous thing to do. I don't know. It's, it's funny. Okay, not that kind of chivalry. I know what you're thinking. I, I think the, the main point of his character that makes it not weird is that you can clearly see his intent. Yeah, And yes. intent matters. And they set that up perfectly. Yeah. And he executes it perfectly. Because mm -hmm. he's, he's just a child at heart in this state. Man, and if that's uh, not just like a perfect example of Robin Williams. He just wants just to a child at heart always. Yeah. All right, you're in timeout, AJ. You're gone. No more, no, no more one-liners from you for another yeah. five minutes. But th this is all. It's also so tragic, though. Like once he finally, you know, gets to kiss the girl, and uh, Jack feels like he's finally done good. Uh, that's when the the Red Knight kind of rears its ugly head again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is honestly like a, a probably the the most disturbing sequence of events in oh, this yeah. movie, where it rears his head, and you you see. Uh, uh, Perry just like just he's like desperate. Just let me have this. Just let me have this. Oh, like that's you can't, so hard to like, watch. And, and he's yeah. getting flashbacks to what the, the trauma that he had forgotten or yeah. was just suppressing. It, it was more like the the situation with his date with the girl brought back memories, positive memories of him and his wife. Yeah, and that he's been suppressing because he watched her die, and yeah. so he's trying to almost like get past it finally. I know. And then in that moment, yeah. he sees the red knight. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, this ends in him going to the same spot where, uh, kind of close to where he lives, the, the same spot where Jack was trying to commit suicide, and then lo and behold are the same Chads. couple of... What are they Chads. doing there? Yeah, they, yeah there? I, I, I was curious about that. What are they doing bringing gasoline that's to That's their a, turf, man. To, the thing but, is, I but think they like were just there to... Heap. I think they're trying... That's like a place where they can cause mayhem and not get caught, so that, yeah. that's where they... 
hoodlums. Yeah, yeah it's just miscreants. Little, yeah, I mean, you can make hey, a story. Hey, maybe they it, always think on. that they can find a, a hobo there or a homeless person there, and they're like, let's see what we can do and get away with. Probably. And this is a, a what I would imagine a, a time period in New York where you could, like, crime was rampant. It was, uh, and I know this is a, a fantastical version of New York, but some of it's kind of based in in truth like funny enough not even as bad as the 70s version of new york yeah new york city was wasn't didn't used to be the safest of places was it the uh, i think it was called the jungle the book or something that was that was based off of new like york concrete jungle or something y- or? yeah well they call it the concrete jungle because it's crazy but like think of a uh, taxi with uh robert de niro taxi yeah. driver it was taxi driver yeah also and back then though potential franchise just saying oh yeah, there you go i didn't know that i would love to do that uh, but yeah back then apparently it was like a uh, a madhouse of a place yeah 90s still bad now a little bit better yeah <laughs> a little bit better uh but y'all's thoughts on this whole sequence of events if y- y'all can still talk about the the more romantic parts of it too yeah. or, or apparently but, i can't so, stop talking this episode shut me up i mean well, I, it's your mini series i think one of the highlights in this movie for me has been a lot of the actors that contributed to all these parts. And I, I gotta say like Amanda Plummer mm-hmm. and Michael Jeter. So great. No, Michael, Michael Jeter, Jeter was, so he was freaking amazing. good in this. Well, I was still trying, uh, the whole time I was trying to determine if that was his actual voice. Oh, it has to be. It is. And the thing is like, <laughs> yeah, it's just shocking to me that he's able to pull that off. One of the best like sub characters uh-huh. gr- ever. Like, uh, he's, so um, he's one of those that kind of similar to this film for me is, just one of those hidden gems where they, he's been in so many things and he's mm-hmm. such a marvelous character actor and just talented without even really trying. Like he's just um, what someone character was that this in the, uh, for our listeners. Huh? Oh, he was uh, a secondary homeless person. He oh, was yeah. the, the so bald, bald man with the, the, the mustache. Kind of like the old cabaret the yeah. singer yes. and dancer. Yeah. He's he's the one that sings to her in <laughs> in her office. Everything's coming up roses, but this time we're talking about uh, videos. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, like, I, for anyone listening great. not familiar with the plot, he helps them, you know, kind of on this ploy to get Lydia to come over to the video store to meet Perry. Exactly. I, I do like how casually uh, Jack deals with this character too. <laughs> it's so odd. I love it. Yeah. Like at one point he's just like holding him. Yeah, or, well, <laughs> they're like, at the hospital. He, throughout this whole movie, he is fulfilling his role as what Perry called him, the chosen one. Mm-hmm. Because throughout the entire film, all of these uh, bums he encounters mm-hmm. are basically ignored by regular mm-hmm. soci- society. But he's the only one that actually listens mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. them mm-hmm. or interacts with them at all, even though it is begrudgingly or kind of in a callous way, everyone just kind of like sur- surpasses them. And like that, the guy... Doesn't uh, even... In the one hospital. guy with he, the, the cup. Yep. He... That someone tries someone to drop a coin by, in. tosses a coin in, completely misses, and then uh, Jack is like, didn't even look at you. Yeah. And then the guy is like, well, they're paying, so they don't have to look at me. Exactly. Oh, but yeah, it, which opens up that yeah. conversation, which so, is great. So much mm-hmm. just in that small conversation yep. right there to unpack. But um, the my point is, uh, even these side characters are amazing actors. Mm-hmm. And Amanda Plummer, like there are few people that can rival Robin Williams, but she is a perfect counterpart to yeah. him mm-hmm. in this movie. Like, like. David was saying earlier, it is very much Anchorman to yeah. Uh, I, I would Kristen say Wood. better. Like, oh that, no, it's well, better. No, no, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking about just if you've the seen Anchorman right. two, you can imagine yeah. a Kristen Wiig and um, I'm sort sort Steve of Carell. like just Steve that. Carell, thank you. Just that there is nobody on this earth like you, and there's nobody on this earth like me. So we are kind of destined for each yeah. other in that I, way. I would almost be tempted to say that they looked at this and thought we can do that. <laughs> 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 yep, it does have. That I, I also liked the um, her brief interact or her brief time with um, Anne. Anne too. They're like yeah. oh, doing yeah. the nails and and oh, just how love they love that scene. It was just a good like, I don't know, good back and forth like that. Both establishing like where they're at and the, uh-huh. hey, you know, uh, 
Yeah, it was cool because they they seemingly bonded, whereas oh, yeah. at first they, or at least, and clearly did not like Lydia, but as it went, it, she came to understand her and was like, oh, you're not so bad. One of my favorite scenes in this movie, which is, it, it doesn't even really progress the plot all that much, but it's when they're doing the nails mm-hmm. and she's kind of explaining her backstory and how nobody pays attention to her. Mm. She doesn't even have a personality. She's like, you know what? Yeah. Look, I'm going to be honest with you. You're kind of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. And like, they, she starts cracking up. She's Lydia like, like, loves She's it. like, really? <laughs> like as it's a compliment because it's the first time someone's had like a reaction or, or has Any shown kind that, of a reaction. like it's yeah. a personality trait yeah, acknowledged her existence in a sense mm. like or, or given her a distinguishing quality like yeah. yeah she has her view of herself that she's just completely like plain nothingness, nothingness to people yeah yeah it's like oh I'm something and and the fact yeah. that they they kind of fall over laughing they're drinking tequila and she's almost just like on the ground like they end up becoming friends through this one interaction yeah mm. um and I and I loved every minute of it. Yeah. Uh, so, so we do we want to talk about this this kind of heavy moment with uh, Robin Williams that results in him becoming catatonic? Oh, I gosh, guess we'll have so to. So sad. Yeah. I mean, I did bring it up, and you then you went back to. Sorry, there's the, so no, many like, things. There's, in this. there's just a lot that yeah. we mm-hmm. wanted to mention. Before no, I know. We got yeah, there. sorry, I kind of glossed over it. I yeah. just didn't want this episode to go two and a half hours. Right. <laughs> so. Right. Or it won't. Yeah. Oh. Um, Brutal. <laughs> I think that's mm. the word to yeah. bring up because it it comes out after the highest high. You know, yeah. yeah. This is where they bring you back to reality. It's the scene where you you went from the beginning, which is a drama, mm-hmm. to the middle, which becomes a romantic comedy, and you almost forget you're in a drama. It's like no, it's a and drama. And then they just hit you in the head with a baseball bat, and they're like, "Remember where you started?" Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, "Oh shit!" At the at, at about the same time, those boys are hitting in the him same with spot. A baseball bat. Yeah, you're right. So it, it hurts. Yeah, <laughs> he almost it's, has his it's breakthrough. It's like reality crashing back in. Where yeah. it's like, even though this movie is is weirdly like high fantasy at times in terms of some of its Energy. its sequences and yeah. just how off kilter it is at times. Uh, yeah, you have this almost honeymoon phase in the movie where everything's kind of glowing and happy, right. and uh, then it just kind of you know comes tumbling down like it, it's put on the rose tinted glasses i guess yeah it's smart because gilliam gives, gives you this false sense of comfort because it, it does feel like oh we're getting towards the end of this movie and oh now things are starting to like for one jack's becoming a better person and robin williams is finally connecting with someone else and you're like oh this is like the final arc uh but then everything just regresses completely yeah. and and you're almost like well what was even the point of all this if both sides learned nothing, and now they're actually kind of back to where they started, and in some cases even worse. Like, uh, yeah, like Jack, he he once he kind of decides that he's he's paid his dues, uh, he goes right back to being this yeah. this DJ, and then oh, you know what? It was nice to have you around for this, um, Anne, but looks like I think we need some space now because I I might be able to return to that the life before uh, and yeah. The only thing that kind of pulls him back from that is realizing that uh, uh, Perry is yeah. not, not doing too well. Um, I, I, I will say, at that point, it wasn't so much like, yeah, cutting ties, I'm going to go back and do my thing. It, I mean, literally it was, but it was more like he's back on his feet again and he wants to see where he is. So he, it, it's almost kind of like karmically he thinks he is due this success now Mm -hmm. he he thinks that he said everything right Mm -hmm. but the interesting thing is he gave perry all the things perry didn't actually ask for the only thing he asked for from him was the the grail grail, Mm -hmm. which he actively avoided so he he gave him money that didn't work out He's like, oh, you love this woman? I'll, I'll get you this woman. Yeah. And he thinks, okay, now we're square. But he, he never actually gives anyone anything they directly asked him for. The true thing they want. Yeah. That, but, that um, said, though, he did try and give them things that he thought they actually needed. Yeah. But that's... But clearly that's he doesn't need a point. literal... I think that's the point grail. of his, his character yeah. is that he's still kind of self-absorbed in mm-hmm. his own ideal of what mm-hmm. how to square things off. And so he, 
even when everything's corrected, he kind of sidelines this woman that's been supporting him the whole yes. time mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. in his effort to pursue what he thinks is success. So it's it's just like he, he didn't actually learn anything. So he's needing mm. to go back and, okay, I have to do things right yeah. this time. And, and yeah. that's one, I guess, negative I have in my book is, you know, I didn't really need the whole double twist at the end. Like, you yeah. can still have a somewhat linear resolution. Um, it was pretty frustrating when he did that. It's like, come on. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it, it I was going to say before you watch this sure. movie, like try to avoid looking at how much the runtime is. Yeah. Because then it's like, oh, is it over? No, we got this now. So Yeah. <laughs> but, I will I mean, say. It, it wasn't a, all bad, but it's right. frustrating. Yeah. For yeah. a long, a long movie, two hours and 20 minutes, like I thought it flew by for yeah. the most part. Yeah. Like me, I, me I, too. I did not think it was slow. I was engrossed in the story the whole time yeah it never slows uh, down mm, it, yeah. it throws a lot at you yeah in this part though i i agree with you aj it's it comes out of left field in a way where he kind of drops Anne so quickly and it, i was doing the math in my head and i was like wait we have the drama we have the build-up we have the positive in any movie, there's always going to be that sort of like last second thing yeah. that throws a wrench in the positivity that you have to overcome. Well, it's and almost, that's that relationship. It almost follows that typical like romantic comedy. Yeah, trajectory exactly. Where it it's is like you know you they're they're together. They're together. They're perfect. They have their ups and downs, and then there's this near breakup scene, and then mm -hmm. they come back together. Yep. The like it's like it, it's almost like it had to have it for that specific part of its <laughs> yeah. mood. I don't know. Yeah, but it it was it was out of left field and it was hard to watch. And I actually was somehow covering my face as I was watching it because I hate those kind of things. Well, the thing is, like, I don't think it needed it to, mm -hmm. to yeah. send the message that it needed to send. Yeah. Like, he could still be in a happy relationship with this woman and uh, still kind of lose sight of you know what he learned to an extent by going back to being this DJ and kind of like I I think that yes, but also I I disagree because. How else is he going to finish and fully realize what he lost if he didn't lose? Well, it? I think that I think the tension should have been around like maintaining connection with Perry. Yeah, like, I, that's like, that's what I could... was, you know, Perry being kind of sidelined back and forth um, when he when Jack has this relapse is like okay, like almost diminishes Perry's significance yeah. to him. And that's what like was frustrating for me. Like, I almost wanted, uh, sorry, Jack to have pretty much everything in his life that he ever wanted. Like, he's now happy with his love, and he has his job back. And I wanted, well, I kind of wanted him to realize that, oh, but I, I, I still need Perry in my life. Like, it's, he, he didn't have to, or just to feel like he dealt with it not entirely correctly. Yeah, and... Yeah, I just don't think they needed the whole re regressing completely back to who he was before to send the same kind of message that they're sending. I think it was uh, hard to watch, but I think they did it well. I yeah. think the the thing I did like about this regression, though, is that he he wasn't fully regressed. It was almost like he was trying to, yeah. but mm -hmm. actively couldn't. Like, just being put back in that environment, That's he true. realized how wrong for it he was now. So I I really did like that sequence where, you know, the first it, thing that happens is uh, Michael uh, Jeter's character, um, what's his name, the, the cabaret guy, uh, basically sorry. confronts him outside of the building he's about to walk into saying like, hey, Jack, we know mm -hmm. each other kind of a thing. And he's trying to kind of like ignore that. And then he goes up where they're trying to pitch this idea that's, Oh, you know, like this life is uh horrible. It's terrible being as rich and powerful as you are. It's a nothing life. But you know, the homeless, they got it good. They have freedom. And he's just kind of like, yeah, I can't actually stomach this and just leaves. Yeah. So I I really did like that sequence. Yeah, and how David Hyde Pierce, who's his agent, like says that one thing and it triggers him and I mean, yeah. they did pay it off well in the end. Right. I do like that scene where um, he does go to Perry's bedside while he's catatonic. And he's like, he's having this full on, like, just shouting match with someone who's completely 
out. Catatonic. But it's him just battling with himself. Yeah, exactly. Sense. So uh, it's just this, re- almost this release of like, he's just really trying to figure out the kind of man he that he is do, at this yeah. point. I think this is a perfect sort of connection with the original story. I feel like Jack at this, when he tries to go back to his original life, it's uh-huh. in this story where, where Parsifal is like, you know what? Screw religion, screw everything. Scary. I'm no, no. I'm talking about the, 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 actually, the story, original story yeah. where Parsifal gives up everything. He's like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to find the grail. I'm going to get what I want. And it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And so he has to sort of drop everything. He has to sort of come to realize that he has to let go and uh-huh. go back to, you know, to the Fisher King to get what he needs. And he realizes, oh, this is what I literally have to do to solve my yeah. problem. Yeah. I think uh, that scene you mentioned, Reese, just mm-hmm. reminds me of something someone told me once where, um, like, you know how everyone kind of makes fun of therapists for not actually helping and not mm-hmm. saying anything? And there is always that running joke where people are just talking out their feelings and yeah. the therapist didn't actually actively say anything. Like, this this scene is kind of um, representing that for me where uh, someone had told me once that you get a lot of information out of people just by not actually responding to them. Yeah. They have this inclination to keep talking and they end up saying more about themselves <laughs> through, you know, nonverbal assents, basically. Yeah. So, you, so you think, uh, yeah, he's Perry's basically he's processing it <laughs> as he goes. Yeah. <laughs> so personal therapy. Almost. <laughs> um, yeah. But he does end up literally climbing this building and getting this grail. Dressed meanwhile, in the original clothing yeah. that Robin Williams wears. Meanwhile, saving a guy from accidental suicide. Yeah. Uh, That's a weird subplot. In a weird subplot that oh, wasn't even necessary. Oh, but if you think of the story of yeah. Parsifal, he goes like to that guy, the or when they're talking about the Fisher King, actually, the, the story is that that fool saw this guy who lives in a castle he's a king but he actually realizes he's very alone so it's almost like he was the chosen one to find him in that exact moment mm-hmm. to save him it all makes so sense. it's it's kind of interesting yeah the fisher king <gasps> we are all the fool and we are all the king mm-hmm. are we all looking for our own grail yeah or helping someone I'm else pretty sure that's what aj said grail. at the beginning yeah. but <laughs> i think we've said it like 10 times already. I know. <laughs> we're looking for the grail yeah you guys, I, I do have some idea <laughs> i do have some words though you, you have might words? appreciate it. i, have I words. would love to hear your words <laughs> yeah we're all looking for a grail <laughs> yes the holy, all of us. the holy yes, grail are. uh holy i want the holy hand whatever. grenade of antioch all right so the movie concludes with um, Jack actually managing to get the grail, takes it to Perry, puts it on him, and uh, basically looks at this as like, hey, I did this for you. Is this like enough? It's almost like a, mm-hmm. like, come on, what it's do like, I have please, to do? Please, come, please back. come back. Yeah. Um, the people are singing and cheering and uh, what's her name? Oh, my gosh. And Lydia. Oh, wait. Anne. No, Lyd- yeah, it's Lydia comes in. Uh, he's not on his bed. Turns out he's kind of been restored. He's come back. Am I missing a chunk? So Lydia had been seeing him in the hospital prior to this. Right. She's yeah. been going back and forth as he was in a catatonic state. Yeah, but he, he does end up coming back uh, only to find um, all of them singing and dancing. Uh, Jack's kind of there, too, just enjoying the whole whatever (laughs) yeah and uh then we cut to uh jack who admits that he does love Anne. yeah he seems fairly reluctant about it but he does it and he's like yeah i love you (laughs) it's it's sweet and the final shot of the movie is both jack and perry naked in central park staring up at the (laughs) sky at the sky with the clouds and the clouds are moving and (laughs) Jack's like, did I do that? Did I do that with my mind? <laughs> and then Perry's like, no, that's the wind. <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> Which I, I love. Oh, that was a perfect close. It was so yeah. good. Um, did yeah. I do that? <laughs> yeah, this movie's great. I, I just have to say, I, I really like this movie. And I'm so glad. Yeah. We're, it, uh, even though it's not a franchise movie at all, or ha- it had any designs on sequels, it's it's. 
I, I really, really enjoyed this. Ending. Highly recommend. And, yeah, we're just glad we're discussing it. So, yeah. Um, in a way, I kind of, I'm kind of glad that AJ said what he said to slip it into here because yeah, I wouldn't have. I, it would, who knows how long it would have been since I had watched this mm-hmm. movie, or until I had, I would have watched this movie. Um, I want to, I want to bring up something I, I didn't bring up while we were covering the scene, but you know when they're going on the dates where they they kind of get Lydia to go out on a Chinese dinner date with, uh, with. Um, oh, what, what, what provoked you to talk about this david it may or may not be the scene that's in front of our faces right now (laughs) um the fact that it's just really well shot but the we were watching a uh uh was an interview with um i'm blanking on jeff bridges jeff bridges thank you and he was talking about i I think this is was it posthumous at the time i think it was where where robin Williams was already dead but he uh was describing how they were on a 14-hour shoot at this point, and it's 4 a.m. when they're doing this dinner scene. Mm-hmm. And it's just like people are kind of tired and exhausted. And I feel like we hear this in almost every movie, but Robin Williams is, like, poking jabs and doing, like, stand-up comedy and, like, and it's just calling people out in comedic ways to create energy in the room. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, the, uh, he was saying that at the at the time, normally a director would be like, all right, Robin, like, cut it out. We need to finish shooting. It's been 14 hours. It's done. But meanwhile, Gilliam was like, he's like, how about this guy? You know, get this guy next. And was like trying to help <laughs> yeah. Robin create that energy. And I'm like, if that's not, if that's not Teamwork. the perfect example of Robin Williams as a person. Like he's just good at activating people. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter how much people are drained or how much he's drained or how many hours he's on set. He's all about creating positive energy with the people he's working with. I've yeah. never heard a bad thing about him on set. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I would say the ending of this movie exudes positive energy. It yeah, does. definitely that does. Segue. I love it. <laughs> uh, Shut it, me up. No, no, I wasn't. I was not shutting you up. I no, no, I, 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 I won't stop talking in. right yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts on the, the, the final moments of this film? No more thoughts? Nope. All right. With that said... Let's close out the story portion of this podcast. On the other end, we will get into our brief reviews with numbered scores, along with some box office, what critics thought, and that'll be it. No analysis on the franchise. (laughs) No analysis on the franchise, because it is not one. We can speculate. We can speculate, yes. What would a sequel of this been like, potentially? All right, let's close it out. Or no. Uh, All right, let's take a quick break. Goodbye. Boop, boop, boop. Welcome back. Let's review The Fisher King. David, you got our scores in the bowl there. Are you going to pull them at random? I am. I don't know why I'm closing my eyes to reach into the bowl because like, I'm just, <laughs> I can't tell. They're folded. Um, first up, Irina with a 10. Dang. Dude, I I really like this. I, I have to give it full marks because I just think that it's so well put together. Yes. And um, I love all the elements that he managed to incorporate and wrap up with a nice bow. It's one of those where you walk away from the movie kind of feeling like you're in a haze. Overall, there's just kind of this uh, heavy feeling, kind of like you ate too much dark chocolate. So I just... But it, it still manages to be a positive, uplifting, kind of a perfect ending in my book. Mm-hmm. Um, I can see how Jack's character kind of kind of going back and forth on the whole, oh, you know, I'm, I don't think I want to stick around with you. I'm going to go my own way, sort of throwing you off and seeing I'm seeming unnecessary. But mm-hmm. for me, it actually made sense with his character. I feel like from personal experience I kind of knew someone like this who just they they can be very sweet and you think there's something more but then kind of turning on a dime in some way that you did not expect mm. it, it felt very real to me David, so it, it didn't actually it didn't actually <laughs> bother me at, at all mm. um so I 
I'm going to stick with it 10. I'm this is a, an instant classic for me. Hell yeah. Yeah. All right. Next up. If I can figure out how to unfold. Oh, it's me. David. <laughs> <laughs> David with an 8.5. All right, uh, do we want to let you guys get through the uh, Dragon Emperor thing first, or should I just go into it? You, you Okay, you need to stop doing that. You keep bringing it up first. I just, we're going to start I, it's saying It's my way it of out. handling it. All I'm right. taking control of the situation here. All right, well, forget about it. We're not going to... Uh-uh. Yeah. You're going to like play it where I, I stop bringing it up, and it just will we'll let it go to the point where we think I forget about it, and you bring it up when yeah. I least expect it? There, there is something, though... I was going to say and uh I don't I don't know what I it was. It. Hey, maybe I'll you maybe it'll but but wait wait wait. I I think I think it had something to do with like mythical beasts somehow. Mythical. Like like snow? Snow maybe. Snow's mythical. Yeah, uh, a little let Noah, apish. You can let Noah flounder if you A little you want. a little apish perhaps. Were they apes? Ape-ish. Hey, David's maybe not mythical. Yetis. Oh. <laughs> maybe yetis. Maybe too, yetis. Man. It was yetis. Yeah. And football. I, I like to think myself as the native Saskatchewan man. Mm. I, I was bred for snow. Sasquatchian. Yeah. Man. Sasquatchian. So, seven, Tomb of the Dragon. not Canadian. Two was what he did. <laughs> not Canadian. Hey, the people have seen the yetis in Canada. All right. All right, maybe. All right, eight out of five. Eight out of five. He's making a Saskatchewan <laughs> joke. <laughs> this is David without alcohol. No, this is David with alcohol. Um, I, I gave this an eight point five out of ten, and um, this was a hard one to rank. And I think everyone will agree with me on that because yeah, it's it's tricky. Such a good movie, but there's something weird and off about it in certain ways, and I can't pinpoint it. And what I guess maybe the reason I like it so much is because I know that I can rewatch this and find something new. Unlike other ones, this isn't the same kind of rewatchability where it's just enjoyable and I can keep coming back to it for good feelings. I feel like there's a lot of deep meaning in this movie that I I could study up on Arthurian legend or I could watch a specific person's performance in this and find something new in it and how it connects to somebody else's. And I, I, I really like that about this movie. I feel like I barely scratched the surface. I barely scratched the surface in understanding some of this stuff. Um, but it was still impactful. I think that's the best part about this movie. Um, 8.5, I think... Oh, man, do I want to give it more? I was debating... I, 10 crossed my mind. 10 crossed your it mind, did. and then you said 8.5. <laughs> no, no, I know, I lean back. Don't, be, hey, don't be pressured just because no, no, I went I'm not, high. I'm not going 10, I, I promise. I'm just saying it did cross my mind, as well as like 7. It literally, it's such a <laughs> wide range, because there was something weird about it that just didn't quite hit, but another part that hit really hard. It's a very weird movie, so I split the difference. Um, I think 8.5 is fair, and I'm going to stick with it. But I loved everybody's performance. I think this is a prime example of Robin Williams doing comedy and drama. This is one of the earlier performances where I think he showcases both. Um, whereas we're Good Will Hunting, and we'll talk about it you know, in future episode, where he leans more into the drama. This is what I want from Robin Williams. I think that without this movie, it's dead. There's nobody I can think of in 1991 who is capable of holding that manic energy and, and allowing other performers to bounce off of him the same way. I think Jeff Bridges even talked about how he was intimidated by Robin Williams when he was making this movie. Um, I would be too. Because he seems like a, a, a scene stealer where it's just yeah. like anytime Robin Williams is on is on like your eye is just drawn to him well, and nothing else. It, yeah, and well Jeff Bridges talked about it in a very positive way. He said it, it he respected Robin Williams and that he really really liked what he brought to the table. Well, well, here's the here's the great thing and I, I just want to play no, off no, of what please, you're saying. No, no, please please do. What I I think Jeff Bridges parries Robin Williams perfectly. Parries? Yes. <laughs> there you go. That was not even what about intentional. Repost? Yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but but what I love that Jeff Bridges realizes, and maybe this was direction from Gilliam as well, but 
you're always looking for Bridges' reaction to something that Robin Williams is yeah. doing. I have a Whereas, perfect so, quote for this. Yeah, so I feel like they share that the, their scenes equally, where it's like, we're all looking at Robin Williams, but you're also like, your eyes always darting to like how Jeff Bridges is reacting to said <laughs> action or mm-hmm. yeah. whatever. And, yeah. and uh, that's exactly what Jeff Bridges was expecting from this. And yeah. he was so impressed by the dramatic performance of, of Robin Williams because he kept going into scenes thinking that he was going to be making him laugh. And he kind of made himself laugh because of that. Mm-hmm. So there's a scene at the end where, where Perry is catatonic and Jeff Bridges' character is trying to wake him up. And I think uh, Bridges was saying in that scene, he, he expected... Uh, Robin Williams to make him laugh so much that he did. He had to do multiple takes because he made himself crack up. Like he thought that Robin Williams was going to make him laugh so much <laughs> that he did it himself. But it, but Robin Williams was being serious. That's so funny. And I love that. I love knowing that that's the kind of performance that Robin Williams can bring. And Jeff Bridges respects it. I don't know. I yeah. love everything about this movie. But there's still some weird little thing. And I'm going to rewatch this movie multiple times. I'm going to buy a copy of this too um, after this. But yeah, an eight point five is a very good score. All right, sorry I talked too much. You're Next up. good. I can't unfold paper tonight. Um, <laughs> Next up, Reese with a nine point oh. I love Dang. it. Yeah, uh, yeah, just short of you know perfection. I think there's certain elements of this movie that I can kind of pick out that aren't quite like nailing it. Um, but. I think this is this movie is such an anomaly. It's something only mm-hmm. that Gilliam could do. If you're a, if you know Gilliam's style, it's unlike anyone else's. It's it's zany, but also there there's always darker themes. There's always more at play, and and there's so much symbolism as well in in, in many of his movies. It's, it's it's like this. His movies are like a circus. But it's so perfectly choreographed, and everything is as it should be. Like, like at one point, things can just seem like just completely out of control, but there's also perfect control at the same time. And, and this movie is, like, no exception to that. Uh, I'll let you cough. Sorry. In addition to this, I, I love the performances. I love Jeff Bridges. I love uh, Robin Williams, obviously, both of them. Um, sorry, uh, what's the other person? Uh, I, uh, Mercedes Rule and Amanda Plummer. It, this movie's basically a four-hander with all four of these characters playing off of each other extremely well. Like you have everyone four brings hands. their. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> everyone brings Probably their A game. <laughs> Wait, that is true. That's a hand. <laughs> it's hard. Um, no, I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> uh, but I, I, another thing that Gilliam does that I love is he. This guy's a sucker for some fantasy. Like he likes fantastical elements in his movies, and even he, in realism. Yeah, he he blends them in with everything. And this movie, with its incorporation of of like these Arth- of Arthurian legend and, and all of this symbolism is it makes this movie so cool and distinct uh, and distinguished from all of the others where it, it, I I can't take my eye off of it and and for a two hour and twenty minute movie like I I have kind of a short attention span when it comes to things I, I have a tendency to look down at my phone and it this was one where you don't really do that you're mm-hmm. you're, you're just I was just invested in it the whole mm-hmm. time. It's it's profound. It's uh, dramatic and funny in all the right ways. It's tender. It's, Nuanced. It's, yeah, very uh, kind of. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't know. It, it, it's just everything wrapped up into a a really tasty package. And yep. <laughs> don't look at me that way. Not, look at me that I'm side not saying eye. anything. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I think it's just a it's a really great movie with with. Some very minor shortcomings. Um, but yeah. Nine. That's nine. a very good score. Yes, it is. It's better than yours. It is. It's also better than your score of Mummy 2 and the Dragon Emperor, which you gave a 7. Oh, it is, and as it should be. Yep. Noah with a 8.0. Yeah. I really like this movie, and I didn't expect that I was going to be on the low end. 
it's it's a very w- weird one to rate. I had no idea where people were going to come in mm-hmm. at, in this one. I just I really like weird yeah. movies. <laughs> no, uh, I think. Well, aside from the great use of symbolism and you know the whole well story, <laughs> my favorite part of this is the cast and just everything they bring to it. Mm-hmm. I think they just all did an amazing job, and each one of them has a lot of charisma. Um, that said, though, y'all pretty much said all the things I was thinking. Um, Why an eight? What well, versus like a ten? What? What? what versus a ten? Uh, I so it seemed like they Noah doesn't like nudity. Oh, he liked no, it. that's he liked it. Uh, I actually did not include that in a, uh, like in that taking down my score at all that had nothing to do with it. Um, I, I would say like, even though they managed to weave all the, the topics in here really well, it did seem like they had one too many issues they were tackling kind of like. You know, you had the mental issues, you had the homeless, you had the suicide, you had the mass shooting. The romantic comedy. The romantic, yeah, the romantic so comedy. So it's like you're, you have a chef trying to juggle too many yeah. things. Yeah, and, and they, you know, they managed to make it work, but it was also just like, you probably could have just stuck with fewer of them and would have been a little more streamlined. Yeah. Maybe that's what m- the but, underlying thing I couldn't figure out was. Uh, but that's like the appeal of Gilliam. Like no, he's no, just it is. like, well, you can, uh, you can, you can like that. There's no problem with liking it. I'm just saying that's why I docked a little bit of points. I, if I really didn't like it, I would have given it a lower score. Uh, I think that might be the ineffable thing that I haven't yeah. been able to sort of grasp mm-hmm. is sort of, how many things he was juggling, and he did put them together well. Yeah, he but did. I'm just so not great used job. to seeing so many mm-hmm. things being put together. Well, maybe that's y'all's problem. It might be, and that's why we give it a lower score. Yeah. Should we move on, mm-hmm. or no? Do you have a? Oh uh, no, I'll I'll keep it at an eight. Perfect. And last but not least, we have a reciprocal 8.0 with AJ. Mm. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. Um. So this was tough, and I'm actually gonna. Echo David and Noah here. Um, And like David, I had, it was a very wide swing between, it's like, you know, is this a 10? Is this an eight? I don't know. Mm, Yeah. So some of this was kind of like shooting from the hip reactionary. And this is one of my favorite, like, I wouldn't rank it super extremely high, but I love this movie. Um, Mm -hmm. And I guess maybe since I've seen it a couple of times before, this recent critical viewing, I was, I don't want to say I phoned it in, but maybe I wasn't hanging on every detail. Like I should have been, um, so that's where some of the things like Noah said, where you know, maybe too many extraneous details, things might have kind of thrown a kink in some of the pacing and the flow, and kind of highlighted that end frustration I had with the extra twist of kind of really mm-hmm. kind of left um an undercurrent of me just not really being sold on Jack's genuine transformation, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm kind of right there with you. I wanted, I wanted to see him have like this, like a, a, yeah. a, a breakdown, like in the rain or something <laughs> like as cliche as that sounds, just something. He hard. had that in the beginning where he almost yeah. committed suicide. Just yeah. the way he, he treated and uh, I don't know. It, it kind of left a, a bitter taste in my mouth a little bit, but and it, it you know, like you, like we said, like we're tied to seeing Robin Williams on the screen. And so it's like almost this mismatch of, of Jack and Perry, um, even though they have a great rapport and there is growth mm-hmm. and development. Um, I feel like that could have, some things could have been pared down a little bit. Um, but I, that's really kind of, I mean, one day I'll be an eight and one day I'll be a 10. It, it's really weird. I'm mm-hmm. shooting from the hip here and, I guess kind of this was kind of pre-reactionary. I was kind of afraid to give this too high because I like this movie so much. So I don't. Um, I'll move it to an eight and a half. I think I'm comfortable with that. All right. I, like I, I really respect this movie and what Gilliam has accomplished. And like it's been said, this is a, one of Robin Williams' best performances. And really, that performance does feel genuine. I feel like um, Jack as the protagonist or the main spotlight character here. 
I wish was developed a little bit better so that he wasn't always this mirror of what Robin Williams was doing and had his own kind of organic development um, that was a little bit more deeply rooted. Uh, maybe a little bit, you know, more from the beginning, I guess. Um, not that it wasn't there. And some of this is like, you know, some of these scenes are kind of tough for me to watch, honestly. I mean, they're pretty hard-hitting, traumatic stuff that deals mm-hmm. with, like, real issues. So, yep. I don't know. It, it, it's very hard to score. Um, eight and a half, it I is. think, is a great movie. And, yeah, it, it's something that should be on everybody's radar, I think. Awesome. It's one of the few movies that I, I would so strongly recommend if you haven't heard of it. It's it's such a unique piece, and if you're listening, which to this is and, weird because a uh, few weeks ago we we were in that boat. <laughs> yeah, I I feel like if you if you haven't heard of this and you're listening to this right now and you've gotten this far somehow, you need to watch it. You just go ahead, rent it for three dollars on Amazon Prime. Just do it now. Uh, all right, AJ, or Vudu, or wherever. No, you get I want I want to share in some of this kickback. Oh, <laughs> do you do we have a way of uh, doing no, that? I don't know. David does apparently. Uh, I, yeah, I do. He's holding out. Uh, sure, group I average my... is an eight point eight. If right. anyone was curious, yeah. uh, I'd see. say that's where it should be. Around yeah, so where it should be compared to other movies that we've covered that do have a franchise, and I was actually going to draw a comparison here: Girl with a Dragon around... Tattoo. Oh, yeah. uh, eight point eight, which. You know, there's kind of similarities with a lot of symbolism and, and detail, but also like kind of tough to watch scenes and dealing with heavy oh, yeah. stuff. But overall, a, sure. a very good movie that might not be That's, you know immediately called upon to rewatch again right away. Yeah, uh, well, I think I think I gave that one an eight or something, and I kick myself every time I think about it. He does. He's brought I, it up. I would so give that a nine point five. Yeah, like. If we could turn back but, time. <laughs> anyways, that's another topic. There is so. one major flaw to that movie that I feel like we forget, though. It's the ending. Exactly. And I think yeah. it is a the one of the worst endings. <laughs> it's, a, it's, just, it's, it's a an, bad it, ending, but it's it doesn't... Not a have... ba- okay. It's not quality bad. It's just you don't like it. Yes. Well, the thing is, that movie, and, and I'm not to get sidetracked, <laughs> we're, but... So we're sidetracked. But, like... That the ending to that movie, it has a satisfying ending, and then it decides to tack on this other scene. That's true. Where Elizabeth Salander's like, "I'm gonna get a gift for Daniel Craig," and then it shows him with another woman and yeah. cuts you, to credits. You know, I'm like, they that's were true. they were banking on a sequel. Exactly. Like that's annoying. I but, know. Uh, anyway, you would have liked. You're not allowed a happy sequel. ending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't even need a happy ending. It's just it seemed disjointed from everything else. Like it. But anyway, I digress. So Can- above Fisher King here at an 8.8, we had Dawn of the Planet of the Apes at an 8.9, as well as Dang, A Fistful, Fistful of, of Dollars at yeah. 8.9. And below we have Tropic Thunder at an 8.6. Nice. All right. All right. I good, like it. Good company. A weird. Like, mm. a, it's. I love our scores because these movies are so weird to I'm pair different. in I scoring. Know. But I love it. I'd put it at that level, though. That feels about right. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Uh, critics. On Rotten Tomatoes, this movie has an 84% with an audience score of 85%. On Metacritic, it, Metacritic, it has a 61 with an audience score of 8.4. And on IMDb, it has a 7.5. Uh, that said, there, there's an asterisk here. I feel like since the the death of Robin Williams, this movie has amassed uh, a higher, uh, more reverent critical following. It's since been released on Criterion Collection, and there's a lot of people taking second looks at this movie and reevaluating it, and it, is, it has gone up in value since then. So uh, those scores are mostly reflective of, you know, when this movie came out, and uh, it has since kind of gained more appraisal. Um, so it is good reviews to, I would say great. And I think it, this is one that only as the days go by continues to be viewed upon as a, as a, uh, a greater film and something that's even more profound than what was originally, uh, I don't know what it was originally viewed as, uh, box office. 
This movie released on September 20th in 1991. Turns out we've covered, like all the films we've covered by Robin Williams so far have been 91 or 92. Did y'all realize that? Yeah. Like that was just a big couple of years for him. That was intentional. Uh, Crazy. Yeah. Uh, So also playing in theaters at the time uh, was a Necessary Roughness, Deceived, and Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare. That was the sixth. Except for it wasn't The Final Nightmare, was it? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Uh, Yeah, that was the final final, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Sixth, not final. Uh, the movie was budgeted at 24... 24 million! Oh, I was gonna do it! You were gonna do that. Yep. I was gonna do it, too. <laughs> Let's guess that box office. Starting with... Budget. I he already said 24 million. You. 24 million. Yeah. I said it... it I, I didn't ask you it. to repeat it. You said budget. I was gonna fit. I was gonna take starting with budget twenty four million. So let sure. me say my. Oh yeah. Sure. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let's start with you, David. Oh. Mm. It didn't get a sequel, did it? Mm. <laughs> didn't want one. <laughs> Sometimes, hey, I've heard you say if a movie makes enough money, it's almost going to have a sequel. Does Titanic have a sequel? Shut up. All right. Um, well, <laughs> was there a Titanic 2? Uh, There's like an Asylum yes. Productions Titanic 2. Did a, you know, I know there, there were was. like three different ships. It's called ships. Poseidon. <laughs> They're like, Poseidon Adventure. Actually, there was another ship also named Titanic. Yes, but that one did crash didn't go too. on the water. It would make a very boring movie. All right. Stop stalling. Give I'm us your <laughs> guess. 100 million. All right. Arena. This is sans inflation, by the way, just to be clear. Mm-hmm. 150. Noah. So David guessed 100 million. Irina guessed 150. Um, How do I box David in best? I'm going to go 101. <laughs> he said, you said 100 though, right, that David? Box yeah, but, but like I think it's higher than 100. Yeah, but the thing is, if it's a higher than 150, you box yourself in. Okay, okay. I bought, I went in the box, but more what I'm doing is cutting you off. Yeah. I have everything below 100. I'm okay with that. AJ. Uh, I feel like the fact that most people haven't heard of this movie is kind of telling. Um, I don't know how early 90s, but let's go with... 91. The, yeah, more than double, less than triple, let's say 65. Now I'm, boxed, now I'm boxed in. There you go. AJ is easily the winner here. Uh, Dang. It was right to go with, like, have you heard of this movie? Mm, like, true. I thought I was aiming on the positive side, so the fact that everyone went above me, I was like, I'm okay with this. Strangely, <laughs> it is one of uh, Gilliam's more successful movies, but that does not mean it was, like, a, a blowout success. Like, it it made $42 million Ooh. worldwide uh, off of $24 million budget. Uh that said, back then, like marketing didn't cost quite as much, uh, and DVD sales or VHS sales in this case were much higher. Uh, so movies could basically bank off of like double release. So while it didn't do amazing, it did fine enough to where that you know Robin Williams is a big enough name. Uh, they were gonna make some money on the back end, and they did. It's 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 looked back on. It's looked back on as a moderate success. Uh, again, this was never intended to have a sequel, so we don't have a sequel to The Fisher King. This is one of, uh, it, it, it's, it's just a good movie, guys. It is. It, it did pretty well and got, and got pretty good reviews. <laughs> and has since garnered more of a following, I feel like. It, it, and I feel like this is even more validated by Criterion, who they seem to just love Gilliam's work like they've like Criterion has Jabberwocky Time Bandits this and um, I want to say there's one other that I'm forgetting but a lot of their movies they brought brought over to the Criterion collection that just gives it this I don't know this a second wave of approval Um, but yeah uh, that ends the discussion of the Fisher King next week we'll be talking about Good morning, Vietnam! No, if you're going to try to even do that, you have to do 110%, not that half-ass 50% you just did. I think you, I think you did. No, no, that I was... I think you did like 55%. Fail. I did it do to it the again. point where it wouldn't Lean destroy back. the mics. Yeah, it, Good morning, Vietnam! 
That's how you're supposed to do it. There you go. Can't wait to punch you in the groin after this episode. I will lay my legs out like this. Inviting it. <laughs> yep. I love it. Love the energy. Yeah, next week. Good morning, Vietnam. I'm not going to yell it. We'll have to wait for next episode. Bitch. Goodbye, guys. <laughs> Bye. See ya. There's three things in this world that you need. Respect for all kinds of life, a nice bowel movement on a regular basis, and a navy blazer. <laughs>